Good afternoon. I am scared by all of you people here. I, I really thank you. I'm Bob Stein, the chair of the seminars, and really thank you all for coming to our first seminar of our 15th season. It, it is really good to see so many of you who've been here before and so many who are here for the first time. So thank you and welcome, welcome to you all. We're going to have five timely and important seminars in this 15th year, and we will continue to provide nonpartisan looks at important public policy issues that are on everybody's mind. Listening, learning, and discussing is especially important as policy positions nationally become more polarized. We hope that the discussion will start here at the seminars, but not end here, and will continue with spirited and courteous discussions after the seminars have concluded. I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in thanking our sponsor, the Yampa Valley Community Foundation. and also our supporting sponsor, Kate and Malcolm Hawk, who are there. Thank you both. And we would not be here in our 15th year without your support. It has enabled us to bring outstanding speakers to Steamboat and keep the seminars free to the community. So again, thank you and thank you uh, if you've not yet become a friend of the seminars this year and would like to, there should be forms in the back so you can sign up on our website, seminars at steamboat.org. Our Dutch tree dinners have moved to the uh, cabin restaurant at the Grand. Let me repeat that. They have moved to the cabin restaurant at the Grand. Rex's was a wonderful home. We are moving, and I hope you will be moving there with us. Tonight is sold out. Others are still available. Parking is across the street. So we will hope that we'll see those of you who signed up at the cabin at the Grand. <laughs> Additionally, we are continuing our partnership with KUNC, Northwest Colorado Public Radio, and I'm pleased that we are joined by Ryan Thompson, who's the operations manager of KUNC. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. Our website will also have a video of this and the other uh, seminars, probably about 15 to uh, two weeks uh, after this, it will, should be up. I also want to thank our board our volunteers, Deb Metcher, our program administrator, for helping get you all in today and all the work that they have done uh, to bring this to the point that we are at. As usual, please turn off your cell phones, recording devices, etc. Our volunteers will be passing out cards for your questions. Please get them in as soon as you can and write as legibly as you are able with our 15th anniversary pins that you have. Uh, Jane Stein, uh, my wife, a founder and longer form, a former board member, uh, will come up and introduce our speaker, Jane. There is hardly a topic that's hotter today than fake news. And our speaker today, the co-founder of factcheck.org, is the number one person to talk about this. Her bio is in the booklet that you, in, in the program, so I'm not going to repeat what's in there. Her latest book, The Oxford Handbook of the Science of Science Communications, was published just last month. She, along with her co-editors, noted that members of a modern democratic society must become experts, not in any particular form of science, but rather at reliably discerning who knows what about what. 
Now, the same holds true for all aspects of journalism. Kathleen Jamison Hall says that the public has to maintain some level of trust that journalists will give them access to a certain amount of neutral information. It is difficult, she says, to have viable policy options and good decision making with, when misinformation or calculated deception shapes policy debates. To that end, she has coined an important and new phrase, viral deception, an illness in our society that can also be called VD. <laughs> That's her term. <laughs> The mission of the seminars at Steamboat is for nonpartisan presentations and civil discourse. Today's seminar will raise issues that we all need to think about, how to distinguish between fact and fiction, how to get people to think outside their comfort zone, how to promote critical thinking. Putting this in a context that's very familiar to me is the motto of Brandeis University where I went to school truth even unto its innermost parts. Please welcome Kathleen Hall Jamison. Thank you, it's good to be with you. And thank you for that kind introduction. I want to extend my thanks to all of you who've made it possible for my husband Bob and for me to be with you. Today, I've never been in this part of the country before, and to say that it is spectacular is something that you know. Those of us from Philadelphia now know why it is a secret that is not widely shared. You would be overrun by us if people drove in from Denver and just view after view after view saw vistas that are beyond description. It is just my pleasure to be here. I, I want to begin by saying that by coining the notion of viral deception VD, I was trying to make a strategic move because I think the notion of fake news is highly problematic. We need to respect news. We need to say there's good news and there's bad news. And when people pretend they are news sites when they are not, and they counterfeit news, we should label it a form of counterfeiting of news. But fake news has become a statement that says, I disagree with something, I found some place that might be called news-like. And that's highly problematic. I'm concerned much more so with the kinds of deception that are trafficked into the public through other kinds of venues outside traditional news venues than with those that periodically do come through the mainstream media. In part because that which I call viral deception is completely unaccountable. It is pseudonymous. We do not know the source. And as a result, we cannot assess its credibility. And there's a reason it's pseudonymous. Those folks who are putting that together don't want us to know who they are because then we would know what their agenda is and their agenda is malicious. It has a second characteristic. It is sent from person to like-minded person outside the ability of the mainstream news and the leaders of communities that care about facticity. And as a result, we have trouble knowing that it's circulating because it's shared among people who don't question it and they don't have any way to challenge it because our institutions set up to challenge those sorts of duplicity are not able to because the networks are so tightly controlled by those who agree with each other. And that is problematic as well. And finally, it has another characteristic. Apart from its lack of accountability, when you call it out, it does not correct. When news makes a mistake, news corrects. And if it doesn't, let's stop calling it news, because that's an accountability norm of journalism. And so to try to get people to stop indiscriminately using the concept fake news, I thought we needed to break the label fake news and put in place something that required you to think completely differently. Hence, venereal disease. <laughs> and I made the assumption that if I could get you to think VD, viral deception, venereal disease, we would break from any notion of news and instead say, I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want it transmitted. I don't want it given to me. I don't want to give it to anyone else. And I want it to be cured. And so people laugh when I say VD, but there was a strategic move behind it to try to move the affective domain that is disgust into this concept of viral deception. 
and to say in the process that it's something we all need to be worried about and we need to mount the kind of public health campaign for democracy that we would mount if we thought that VD was circulating indiscriminately throughout our community. Hence the quotation marks <laughs> for fake news. This is my plug for a place that you can go to see whether or not we found something that we consider to be duplicity. And please, if you're not a subscriber to factcheck.org and its subsite SciCheck, please give us a look. It's no cost. And if you see something you think we should check, please send it to me. There's a link on the site. And if you think we haven't gotten something right, please let us know. We believe that self-correction is a hallmark of a legitimate news site. Here I want to start out by saying, there's some things I'm not going to be talking about, and I want to mark them off just to make sure that there's no confusion. I'm not talking about carefully calculated uses of language, and I'd like to give you a couple of quick illustrations of what I'm not talking about, <laughs> and in the process, to talk about them, thereby raising real questions about my credibility. <laughs> so right now, we are hearing in the body politic some people using the word cut, and some people using the phrase slowing the rate of growth. This is not a discussion that only happens on one side of the aisle, and it doesn't predictably happen on one side rather than the other. It happens whenever it's convenient for somebody to characterize something as a cut, when the other side says, wait a minute, we didn't cut, we're slowing the rate of growth. The job of news is to say, those two things are meaning the same thing. Now we're going to contextualize what that is by telling you what the rate of growth is going to be, what the dollar amount of growth is going to be, what dollar amount we won't have as a result of the slowing of the rate of growth, and that's what news is supposed to do. It's supposed to contextualize. I'm not talking about that, although I just did. <laughs> Here are some illustrations of how it was used on each side in the past. I'm gonna telegraph them quickly without talking through them. This is gonna cause a nightmare for the nice people from NPR who have to edit this into discernible audio. This is the place, nice people from NPR, that just cut the audio out. <laughs> now what you're seeing is both sides use it when it's convenient. So this isn't just the Democrats doing it, just the Republicans doing it, they do it when it's convenient. And we're seeing it right now. Here are some others. What those essentially do is invite you to perceive through the use of language in a way that's selective and obscures the underlying issue. It's important that it happens, it's important that we contextualize it, but I'm not going to worry about doing that now. Instead, what I'm discussing is deliberate political and viral deception. Now I know by putting deliberate up there I'm running into a landmine, because how can I possibly know it's deliberate? So let me tell you how I think I know some things are deliberate, when they are repeatedly corrected and people repeatedly say them. I'm going to assume that when that happens, it's deliberate. They've had a chance to change, and they didn't change. And you know how I'm using the word fake news. So let me start out by saying I want to answer a series of questions. What does it look like? And this is political deception, viral deception. Why does it work? How do we blunt the effects of it? And how do we arm the public to detect, detect deception? First, what does it look like? Some of this stuff is just going to look silly. But some of this stuff is going to look implausible to you, but it's not implausible to someone else. So these are statements that are problematic because some are willing to believe them. At least eight trans youth have committed suicide in the wake of Trump's win, according to a private support group. No evidence to support the claim. White supremacist lynches himself after learning of his black ancestry. <laughs> No evidence to support the claim. <laughs> Dr. Gallo, I invented AIDS to depopulate humanity. No, he did not say that. No, he did not do that. This is implausible on its face. But notice it has the trappings of news and a news site. And the form of news carries a certain kind of plausibility. We need to be aware of it so that when we see it, we don't get gulled by it. In this case, we're not likely to be gulled by it. Nonetheless, it's circulating. The danger is some will believe. Pope Francis shocks the world by endorsing Donald Trump for president and releases a statement. Again, the forum looks news-like. No, he didn't. Furious Chelsea Clinton thrown to the floor and handcuffed after Senator Lindsey's scandal linked to Clinton Foundation. Didn't happen. 
Graham says Christians must support Trump or face death camps. <laughs> Didn't happen. ISIS leader calls for American Muslim voters to support Hillary Clinton. Didn't happen. Unicorn bones discovered at Atlantis. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> Now look at all the people who have died and you missed it. No, they didn't. Not yet. We all will. There will be truth to these statements at some point, but not yet. Viral deception. Spicer, Trump has the legal right to cancel SCOTUS, that's the Supreme Court, because they serve at his pleasure. Didn't say it. That's my definition by, Supreme, by, the, by the way of Supreme Court. Now, what does it look like when it is into the zone I call the silly zone. We're now going to play some audio. NPR folks, these are people talking. You'll hear their voices. And uh, this, this may is Alex Jones in way out, interviewing someone. We actually believe that there is a colony on Mars that is populated by children who were kidnapped and sent into space on a 20-year ride uh, so that once they get to Mars, they have no alternative but to be slaves on the Mars colony. Oh, there's all kinds of... Well, look, I know 90% of the, of, the, of the NASA missions are secret, and I've been told by high-level NASA engineers that the, you have no idea. There's so much stuff going on, but then it goes off into all that. I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing the media jumps on, but I know this. We see a bunch of a mechanical wreckage on Mars, and people say, oh, look, it looks like, you know, a mechanics. They go, oh, you're a conspiracy terrorist. Clearly, they don't want us looking into what's happening. Every time probes go over, they turn them off. Yes, people do say you are a conspiracy theorist. That's accurate. That's Alex Jones' Infowars. Even the mainstream media are occasionally fooled. This one is just silly. Introducing the selfie shoes. No matter where you go, you'll always be camera ready. Just insert your phone into the port, raise it to the perfect angle, and click the internal button with the tap of your toe to take the photo. Oops, USA Today got it wrong, but it's a legitimate news source, it corrected. So which quote-unquote fake news stories are most concerning? The ones with consequential outcomes. And I'm going to focus here on consequential political deception. One example from each side, consequential deception, because people may believe something and as a result, may feel as if they've been betrayed when it doesn't actually happen. We will keep this promise to the American people. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. We knew at the time that that promise could not be kept because of the structure of the insurance market. The fact checkers pointed that out. It couldn't be kept because of the structure of the insurance market. Another example. When you hear 4.9 and 5% unemployment, the number's probably 28, 29, as high as 35. In fact, I even heard recently 42%. Why does it matter what the number is and that we have procedures and carefully specified methods to determine over time, using the same measures, what we call the unemployment rate? Because your policy is going to differ depending on what you think the nature of the problem is and the extent of the problem. So if you don't specify it accurately, you're not going to engage in discussion about alternatives that are plausible and that we have learned across time are more effective under some circumstances than they are other, under others. Another instance, I'm now reading from the screen. The Daily Mail claimed that Melania Trump worked as an escort in the 1990s. This is a troubling, illegitimate claim. Consequential political deception, this one you know as well, but I'm going to play it anyway because I find the reminder so important as we ask, why is it consequential? Even though we're not deceived by something, even though we say nobody plausibly is going to believe it, if someone does and acts on it, it can be highly problematic. This past December, Edgar Welch opened fire in a Washington, D.C. pizzeria. He told police he was there to rescue children forced into prostitution by Hillary Clinton. The story of Secretary Clinton's child sex trafficking operation in a pizzeria was invented before the election by fraudulent news sites and shared by millions. 
Why does it work? We have human vulnerabilities that make it more difficult for us to process under certain kinds of circumstances. And news has trouble overcoming those human vulnerabilities. First, we're prone to uncritically accept and spread content we agree with. That's how you get these like-minded enclaves circulating things that would be debunked if they came into circles that the mainstream media had exposure to, but those who are circulating them don't ever get that exposure and may, in an environment in which the media have systematically been discredited, not believe them if they were debunked. Once accepted, misinformation is remarkably tenacious. We are prone to accept information consistent with our own existing beliefs, and familiarity equals perceived accuracy, which is why when something is repeated and repeatedly distributed, it gains a life of its own. Let's go back to we're prone to uncritically accept and spread content we agree with. These are data from the Pew Charitable Trust. Many Americans believe fake news is sowing confusion. Yes, it is. But here's the finding that I'd like to feature. About one in four report sharing fabricated news, whether aware at the time or not. Why did they do it? They did it because at the time they were in a like-minded network and it's a natural disposition, particularly with the capacity of the internet to quickly hit that button and forward to a list of friends to forward and to share. Once accepted, misinformation is tenacious. This is a meta-analysis that we've just published that confirms across all of the existing research that the persistence of information in the face of debunking is real. Now, notice the nature of that finding. It doesn't simply say misinformation of itself is tenacious. It says even when you debunk it, it tends to have an afterlife. Part of the reason is that when we lay down a piece of information, we say, for example, that Kathleen Jameson is married to the handsomest man in this room, <laughs> when any of the wives in this room or partners in this room take exception to it by saying not, the laying of the memory trace is still there, and my husband is greatly relieved that I still think that after almost 50 years of marriage. <laughs> we are prone to accept information consistent with our existing beliefs. Here's the North Korean <laughs> top leader named the Onion's sexiest man alive for 2012, and there's People's Daily Online featuring it. I suspect that Kim Jong-un thinks that's true, we know The Onion is a satire site. Nonetheless, it's demonstrating my point. We also know that people are more likely to believe the things that are consistent with belief as well as fake stories inconsistent with their beliefs. They're more likely, if they're inconsistent, to reject them unless they've seen them before. So persistence and accuracy are actually related when you get high levels of ongoing exposure to something. That is, familiarity increases the likelihood of perceived accuracy. Here's a citation to a very finely done study which suggests that. Even when you've seen familiar headlines once before, you've increased the likelihood that you think they're accurate. And this is true even if you are saying to yourself as you see them, I think they're inaccurate. This is because of the nature of memory tracing as best the psychologists can figure out. And so it works because there's some human dispositions at play that increase the likelihood that it works. So what can we do about it? How can we blunt the effects of deception? We did a major study of the impact of factcheck.org as well as a parody website that we created to increase the likelihood that those on the younger end of the age spectrum would consume political information. And what we found was that if you develop information carefully and get the audience involved in processing it deeply in a story structure that is engaging, you can effectively debunk. Now look at all the predicates I had to put in place before I said you can effectively debunk and ask how often are we going to get people to actually process news that way. It's not that it can't work, it's that it doesn't tend to work if we're going to process quickly and if we're going to process superficially. So let's look at how we can debunk. First, let's stop it before it circulates. Solve the problem. Let's fact check it in real time so the memory doesn't set, so that we've got the correction in as the memory is laid down. Let's use visuals to overwhelm it by overwriting it. And then let's just simply overwhelming it by continuing to fact check it. Stop it before it circulates. Here's how the Trumps responded to the false allegation about Melania Trump. That settlement decreases the likelihood that that is going to be trafficked out virally in the future. 
But under most circumstances, people can't afford to litigate. They don't know who they're litigating against in the case of viral deception, and as a result, it's not a particularly viable solution. And we have many distinguished lawyers in the room, and they will tell us it's awfully hard to win lawsuits, and it's really expensive to file them to begin with. But nonetheless, it is potentially a preventative. They got a retraction, and it stopped circulating because the threat of lawsuit continued to hang over the heads of anyone who had repeated who could be found. Dispute by third parties. This is what Facebook is doing. Before you share the story, you may want to know that independent fact checkers disputed its accuracy. We're part of a group of five fact checking organizations that partnered with Facebook to increase the likelihood that when something that has been flagged by one of us as problematic or deceptive is called up in a search, we get a warning up before. So you, before you've laid down the memory trace, you've laid down that somebody thinks it's false. And now you have the choice. You can say, I don't care, cancel, or continue, I want to read it. Today, we're testing some new features on newsfeed. This is Facebook. An item may be flagged in your newsfeed if it has been disputed by an independent third-party fact checker outside of Facebook. You may see an alert before you share some links that have been disputed by third-party fact checkers. You can then cancel or continue with the post. If you suspect a news story is fake, you can report it. It just takes a few taps. Your report helps us track and prevent fake news from spreading. This is a very important initiative because viral deception moves across the internet. This lets the fact-checking organizations enter that dialogue at the beginning, and that opening slide is particularly important. Would you like to know why they consider it problematic? So we haven't told you that the specific claim is, which might trigger your ideology and say, wait a minute, I don't want to look at this at all. We've asked you a question which increases the likelihood that you're going to say, yeah, I guess I would like, and the minute we're able to do that, our memory trace goes down before that memory trace goes down, if in fact you do follow through and actually read that story. So stop it before it circulates, and here's Google's Project Owl. When you type in something and you're asking for something that may be problematic but may not be, Google was by algorithm giving you the most popular material that would come up when you search those terms. So sometimes it was giving you information that says the Holocaust was not real. Well, that's highly problematic because now we have individuals who are being exposed to problematic content on a search that may never have been intended to go that way. And for those who are intending to go that way, they're now getting it more expeditiously. And we were suggesting in that process, or they were suggesting by their algorithm, that that's legitimate. Most people must have searched for it that way or it wouldn't have popped on the algorithm. So here's what they're doing now. Why do the Irish, I put this in for my Irish husband, here are your choices. Okay. And then promoting authoritative content. So is Donald Trump giving $620 to all working Americans? The fact checkers come up on the top of the algorithm. All this is trying to do is increasing the access of people who might be locked into a like-minded enclave to information that might help them avoid layering in one more deception. And I applaud the people in Silicon Valley for finally figuring this out. I applaud them for figuring it out. I don't applaud them for the finally. Fact check it in real time. When someone is saying something deceptive and you catch it as you're hearing it, the correction is laid down with the deception and news media are starting to try to do it. Now, this is potentially very problematic because if they get it wrong, they are potentially discrediting themselves with an audience that should be building trust in a news outlet and not being, having its trust undermined. So when this is done, it has to be done very, very carefully. And the reason we have never fact-checked live in real time on debates, except for facts we have already checked prior to a debate, and many of them have been repeated before, so we've checked them before, is because you've got to be so excruciatingly careful. It's so easy to get it wrong. But nonetheless, when you get it right, it's potentially helpful.
use visuals to overwrite a problematic statement. We know that people process visuals more quickly and more deeply. And as a result, they have a capacity, visuals do, to overwrite what it is we've heard or we've seen in print. Here's an example. I just left 50 or 60 farmers in the back, and they can't get water. And I say, how tough is it? How bad is the drought? There is no drought. Is that true? There is no drought? No, that's not true. California is in the fifth year of a severe, quote, hot drought, the kind that's expected to become more frequent with climate change. California's drought began in late 2011. By January 2014, the situation was so dire that Governor Jerry Brown declared the drought a state of emergency. In fact, the current drought is unique compared with previous droughts. The past four years have been the driest since record keeping began in the late 1800s. Now, thankfully, California has since gotten rain, but this is 2016. When you see the visuals of the drought, as they talk about the drought, you process the drought more deeply as factually accurate information. In part, that's why we say seeing is believing, and that's partly why when visuals deceive, they are so difficult to dislodge. But what I mean when I say overwrite with visuals, it's this. Amplify the verbal content visually to lock this down in memory so that people have an experience of it that is deeper than the print experience and the oral experience of simply hearing it. And then finally, simply overwhelm it. Now, some of you are saying she's using a lot of Trump examples. I'm worried about this. This looks like liberal bias. Let me tell you that if I were giving you the same lecture during the Obama administration, you would have said this looks like Obama, Democratic bias. You would have said the same thing about Bush, but in the opposite direction, Clinton in the opposite direction. That said, there are more total problematic statements to look at during this presidency. Nonetheless, I would have, had we had a president of a different party, been finding things there as well, perhaps not to the same extent. That's a counterfactual I can't actually document, because of course we can't have two presidencies at the same time, in real time, except in some other countries, and we're not one of them, mercifully. Let's look at overwhelming it. Now we've got a series of fact checks on Donald Trump's claim that Barack Obama was not born in the United States, hence is not a citizen, hence cannot be president of the United States. These are fact checks from factcheck.org, Washington Post, PolitiFact, The New York Times, Politico, again PolitiFact, again factcheck.org. Now to the extent that you say these are partisan entities, they have no capacity, and you will rebut them, you will counter argue them. And so the question is, have they retained enough credibility for you to read through their evidence to see whether the evidence is there to sustain their claims? As people argue that fact checkers are biased, we increase the likelihood people will never read to find out what the evidence is, and we will lose, potentially lose this protection. Another one from us, another one from us, another one from us, and this is from us. Which show that Obama's birth certificate has a raised seal, signature, and everything the U.S. State Department requires to prove U.S. citizenship by birth. Now, if you're skeptical of us, you can say we made it up and we fabricated the visual. But of these, the one that is most likely to be the most powerful is actually showing that it exists and it has the characteristics that define a legal birth certificate in Hawaii. What is the result of this? President Barack Obama was born in the United States, period. What can we do to arm the public against deception? One thing we shouldn't be doing alone is trying to catch it one by one. What we should be trying to do is to increase the capacity of individuals to see it, to flag it, to not send it to others, to tell Facebook, do something about this. And we should try to increase the capacity of all of us to do that when it's our own ideological side that is engaging in the deception, which is extraordinarily difficult to do. But let's ask, is there a way to arm the public realizing it's difficult? And I'm going to argue, yes, there is. We can fact check in unanticipated venues. We can learn to identify patterns of deception and learn to say when we see a pattern, whether it's our person or the other side's person, that pattern is wrong, and we're going to condemn the pattern. 
And what I like about this move is we're not condemning a person who is using a pattern, we're condemning a pattern. We're saying they're norms of acceptable discourse, they're evidentiary standards that we will adhere to because doing so makes it possible for our, us to deal better with each other, particularly when we're deliberating about controversial measures. And then finally, learning to recognize deceptions by our own side. Let's start with the first, fact-checking in unanticipated venues. This is an attempt by one of the comedy channels, in this case it's The Daily Show, to reach a younger audience. Next up we've got... If Putin wants to go in, and I got to know him very well because we were both on 60 Minutes, we were stable mates, and we did very well that night. Aww. <laughs> Trump is so cute. He thinks he's friends with Putin because they were on a show together. Well, now technically Trump and Putin did appear on the same episode of 60 Minutes in two completely unrelated segments that were shot in different cities. <laughs> in different countries, on different continents. Now what I like about that piece is the visual reinforcement of the fact checking because we know that that is more effective than simple verbal debunking. But there's another point here to be made. It's a younger person doing the checking, not someone my age not the age of Kessler at the Post, not the age of the typical journalist you see on television doing fact-checking, and it's not a traditional venue. It's a venue where you're more likely to find a younger audience. But you're more likely to find a liberal audience there. How do we find venues in which you're more likely to find a younger conservative audience? How do we find venues in which you're more likely to find anti-vaxxers, people who don't support vaccination with the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine? They're not going to traditionally fall into the usual news categories or the usual entertainment categories. If we can find them where they are and fact check credibly with the principles that we have, we'll increase the likelihood, not that everybody will say, yes, that's accurate, but that on the margin, we will change enough to change the deliberation within the community. And that's the goal. People who are tightly anchored in their own ideology are not likely to be susceptible under most circumstances. We can learn to identify patterns of deception. How many of you think Abraham Lincoln was a great president? Raise your hands. How many think he was just an okay president? How many think we just give him back? We wouldn't lose anything. Okay, how about George McClellan? Can somebody stand up for George McClellan for me? You know, he ran against Abraham Lincoln, you know? A really important general. His only problem was he had trouble trying to get out there to fight. He tended to stall around a lot. We think that the way we teach people patterns of deception are to get them out of their ideological space. And so we've created a campaign to attack Abraham Lincoln. This is first category. Can we learn to see things taken out of context? Second, can we learn what guilt by association looks like? Third, can we learn when something's just being made up? Let me try the first. Has President Lincoln given up at a speech in Pennsylvania, he even refused to dedicate a battlefield still fresh with the blood of tens of thousands of Union soldiers. We cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. Lincoln believes that America will perish from the earth. Perish from the earth. And that our soldiers have died in vain. Died in vain. Honestly, Abe, died in vain in vain, in vain, in vain, in vain. Abraham Lincoln, wrong on the war, wrong for the Union. I am George B. McClellan, and I approve this message. <laughs> now, notice what we're trying to do. We're trying to show what out of context looks like, but we're trying to show you the form that it takes in political advertising so that when you see those markers in a political ad, the announcer's voice fades out and suddenly a Lincoln voice fades in. What was that statement by the announcer and did Lincoln actually make it? What we're trying to do is to get you to say, oh, that looks like it may be out of context. When you see the voice echoing a statement on the screen with print, you can bet that's out of context. When you see something that doesn't have a subject but has a verb and an object, that's pretty likely to be out of context. What we're trying to say is, let's identify it when we see it and say, our side does it, we condemn it. Your side does it, we condemn it. But we're gonna condemn it consistently. Well, to do that, we've gotta recognize the patterns. And we as a community have to say, 
We're not going to tolerate that. That's unacceptable to us. Second example, guilt by association. Again, here's Abraham Lincoln. They say that behind every powerful man, there is a woman. What do we really know about the woman behind Mr. Lincoln? We know that Mrs. Lincoln is a daughter of Dixie. We know that Mrs. Lincoln has three brothers fighting for the Confederacy. We know that Mrs. Lincoln even had a rebel's wife living in the White House. We know who stands behind Mr. Lincoln, but who's standing behind her? I am George B. McClellan, and I approve this message. Now, what this is trying to show is that you can take statements that are factually accurate. Those statements about Mary Todd Lincoln are factually accurate. You can put them together in order to drive a false inference when you're making misleading associations. And now, this is my favorite. It's a little bit long, but I think you'll get the point. There are often ads that are accurate, accurate, accurate. Now you trust them, inaccurate, 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 and you're still trusting them. Ready? I served with George McClellan. George McClellan cannot be trusted. He's lying about his record. George McClellan has not been honest about what happened in the Peninsula campaign. I saw what happened. When the president ordered him to attack, he didn't. He just sat there with his dumb mustache drooping. We failed to take Richmond. We could have ended the war right then and there. The Confederates dispelled any doubt that George McClellan is a horse's well, I'm not saying George McClellan is a coward, but I am thinking it. He is a tiny, tiny man. I've seen cats larger than George McClellan. When we were children, my sister beat him up. She nailed his chest, and when he screamed for help, she spit in his mouth. The Confederates did much the same. He dishonored his country. He most certainly did. Steamboat Veterans for Truth is solely responsible for the content of this ad. <laughs> the most effective deceptive advertising starts out with statements that are plausible and often accurate before it segues into those that are problematic. It's the yes, 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 and you, mi you miss the but, and you miss the no, and you miss the objection because you're now caught in the pattern. The first statements are accurate. We actually went through all of the letters and all of the diaries to find statements that people actually made and to the extent possible identified them accurately. We did not actually use real pictures of them because we couldn't find them in one case, but one of the pictures is actually an accurate picture of one of the people who said one of the things. But by the time you get to the point in which my sister beat him up and spit in his mouth, you're supposed to be saying, wait a minute, when did it become inaccurate? And did I buy anything I should have caught before that? And the hope is that in the process, you will recognize a pattern. And when you see the first suspect statement, start to fight the inference. So we think a second move against deception is increasing the likelihood that people recognize patterns of deception outside any political context, McClellan Lincoln. And then when we come into their political context, are able to see it on both sides. We think that the fact-checking organization should use a consistent vocabulary to label these things to increase the likelihood that we are able to recognize them. And in the words of psychologists, we start to get a schematic understanding of them. We start to get a concept in our head of them so that we can use them. They become part of our ordinary vocabulary. And the value of this is enormous because when someone we're talking with makes one of these errors, we have a label for it. Ideally, we constructively point out why that isn't the best way to analyze that argument. But more importantly, when we are doing it, we would increase, we hope, the likelihood we would see that we are doing it as well and put a break on that disposition on our own part. One of the problems with licensing these sorts of things in politics, as we have routinely in political advertising and political discourse, is we are going to increasingly license them in our own lives. And apart from making it more difficult to have a functional body politic, it's going to make it a lot more difficult to have a functional community, a functional family, a functional friendship, a functional marriage, at the point of which what one used to call ad hominem attack, and I now call ad feminem attack, so we can get both men and women into it. That's my one reference to Latin for the evening. That when we hear ourselves doing it, we say, wait a minute, that's illegitimate. We used to teach something called fallacies in school. We don't do it anymore. We need to teach them. We need to teach the categories of argument and bound them by whether they're legitimate or illegitimate and the circumstances under which they are each. 
My last category, we need to learn to recognize deceptions by our own side. This is called death by wheelchair. For the NPR listeners, when you don't hear talking on the screen, but you hear the audience here, the live audience here laughing, it means that an elderly woman actress, a woman who is made up to be an elderly woman, who is an actress, is being thrown off a cliff in a wheelchair. And in one case, the person who seems to be throwing her off the cliff is Barack Obama. In the other case, the person who appears to be throwing her off the cliff is Paul Ryan. Now, in no case is anyone actually thrown off a cliff. Barack Obama did not appear in any of these ads, nor did Paul Ryan. These are all actors. This is my disclaimer. We created this for flackcheck.org to see whether or not we could increase the likelihood that people would see the pattern of deception being employed by both Democrats and Republicans. We then did an experiment to find out whether we could. The experiment said we can. Let's see if my experiment was right. Let's see if you think it works. It was another one of those days, raining, but not enough rain to wash the filth straight off the streets. Homicide report on my desk. Another one, I thought out loud, pouring myself a stiff breakfast. Crumpled wheelchair, elderly woman, 67, 69, smashed against the rocks. Pattern I'd seen before. Knew what the autopsy report would say. Last year, same cliff, same MO. We weren't dealing with a murderer anymore. This is a serial killer. Our perp is a homicidal freak, no self-control. Spends time with his victims. Takes the dames for a leisurely ride through the park, then ices them. Treats her like a lady until she's thrown off the cliff screaming and now it's happened again no no i need a pacemaker ah! Ah! a few things didn't add up a group calling itself the agenda project fingers congressman paul ryan as the killer but according to a trusted source the killer ignored the fact that the ryan plan would not affect people currently in medicare or even the people 55 to 65 who would join the program in the next 10 years a supposed source on the street, American Doctors for Truth, says President Obama's the perp, that he's rationing health care, voted to cut Medicare's budget. President Obama began throwing seniors off the cliff when they voted to cut Medicare's budget by $575 billion. But another trusted source slipped me this piece of information. That's actually a reduction in the future growth of spending over 10 years, not a slashing of the current budget. That's when I put it together. The Agenda Project, American Doctors for Truth, two anonymous groups, both present at the scene of the crime. Is it Obama? Is it Ryan? Not on your life. These dames were killed by deception. Deception and a cliff. We rarely have the Democrats and the Republicans producing virtually identical ads with the same pattern of deception underneath. Every time we see it, we're going to produce another one of these because we think it's helpful when we are able to show both sides using the same tactic to invite people to see that their side is one of the two. One of the things that we know when we study incivility, a cousin of this form of deception because they tend to co-vary, is that those on the left tend to police incivility on the right. And those on the right tend to police incivility on the left. And by doing it, they increase the likelihood that their viewers will think, yes, there's incivility over there, not over here. And so we paired instances, it was this same experimental move, of people on the left and people on the right using virtually the same uncivil statement. In one case, it was calling a woman a slut, when one disagreed with their political position, and the other a talk slut. One Democrat, one Republican. I won't tell you which, but I bet some of you can guess. Another one was use of Hitler references. So in one case, it was Hitler, a Hitler sign, allying him to Obama. In one, it was a Hitler sign allying him to Walker, governor of Wisconsin. So we paired them, and we asked. We had 10 of those in total. Another one was claiming the other side wanted people to die as a result of passing legislation. So saying, if this passes, they're doing it because they want people to die. Not people will die because of, but they intentionally, they want people to die. We had 10 of these categories where we paired them up. And we asked, 
MSNBC, Fox, and CNN transcripts to tell us what was the likelihood that the incivility would be policed on the ideological side of the network. And what we concluded was, on MSNBC, you saw a whole lot of policing of Republican incivility. On Fox, you saw a whole lot of policing of Democratic incivility. And on CNN, they just love incivility. They were just going after anywhere they could find it. <laughs> In the process, we learned something else. We have a sense that our culture is coarsening, and I suspect careful analysis will bear out that it actually is. But to some extent, replaying instances of the coarsening increases the likelihood that we think it's prevalent when it actually isn't. And to the extent that we think it's prevalent, we may come to think that it is more acceptable than it is. And to the extent that we only conde condemn it on the other side, and we miss that it's happening on our side, we're losing the most powerful way we have to decrease the likelihood of incivility. Because the other side isn't likely to listen to us, but our own side is. And as a result, there's a pernicious tendency at play, both in deceptive content and in uncivil content, to be pretty good about seeing it over there and not pretty good about seeing it over here. Death by wheelchair is our attempt to try to counteract that. So summary. We have one ultimate protection. It's not catching it case by case, although we need to do it. It isn't forewarning by letting you know that you, you, know, you may have deceptive content coming up. Do you really want to see it? Do you want to know why it's deceptive before you see it? It's not necessarily increasing the likelihood that people within individual news venues and non-news venues are, in, are engaging in fact-checking. If fact-checking has been discredited, that's not going to work either. The ultimate protection is us. I'd be happy to take your comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. That was an excellent presentation with a lot to think about. Please hand your questions in and they'll be um, handed up here. To get the questions rolling, last month, um, Tom Friedman in the New York Times wrote about an answer to a question he was um, raised by a Canadian about what he fears most these days. He said, I fear we're seeing an end to truth. We simply can't agree anymore on basic facts. So the question is, do you see an end to truth in the political arena, and can truth become really irrelevant in politics? Let me answer not by using the word truth, but by using the word facticity. And the reason is I double majored in philosophy and communication, and I don't want to get metaphysical about what is the truth. <laughs> I do believe that we are seeing a challenge to the notion of the factual. And in part, the academic community helped seed this. Now, I don't blame the academic community in its, for the entire problem, but the academic community in part seeded this. Because how many of you are college professors, emeritus college professors, high school teachers? There was a period in the academy in which a number of departments, English and sociology leading the way, argued that there really wasn't any such thing as a ground that was knowable. Everything was perspectival. And this period turned out at least two full generations of college students. I now get questions from them as journalists that ha are tainted with the presumption that everybody's side has some legitimacy to it if you can just find out where they're coming from. Well, at some level you can say they did come to it somehow, so there must have been some rationale for it, but it is, and now I will use the word true, true that taking the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination as a child has many, many, many more benefits than it has risks, both to the individual and to the community. It is, and now I will use the word true, but carefully, true that the scientific community spent an enormous amount of money trying to determine whether a bogus, fraudulent article produced by a person named Wakefield and his colleagues had any scientific basis in fact and after spending millions and millions of dollars that could have been spent on something else, could find no evidence of a causal link between the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine and autism. 
So there are things that we can know as best humans can know them in this moment in time. They may not be absolutely categorically true in a platonic sense, but we can, and those are the things on which we have to act. It is true that there are methods available, and we have a person seated in the front row who knows more about this than any person I know. There are methods available to economists that are carefully vetted that determine what we call unemployment by what survey method we use. And we have a payroll survey, we have a household survey, they have somewhat different methods, they come to somewhat different conclusions, those are all specified. As long as those things are held constant across time, we know something. We know whether the this that we are talking about by those methods is getting worse or getting better. And if there's something wrong with the measure, we have procedures to fix the measure, and we are constantly, as a scholarly community, in this case, the economists and the statisticians working to try to perfect those. So you see changes in economic indicators. You, you see you know, GNP becoming GDP, for example. So to the extent that we can know, we do know through these kinds of reliable methods, that's now being challenged. But the majority of people who are in government right now behind closed doors still honor those things. The question is, are they telling the public what the public wants to hear because it is convenient in that moment for them in the short term to get reelected, or will they stand up and tell us what is actually knowable by the best available methods and then act on it? which is why the citizenry actually becomes the protection here. Because the citizenry empowers those who lead to lead well by trying to make sure that in our own communities we are standing up for what is known and knowable based on good available evidence. How, how would you address um, the issue of freedom of speech when some of the speech is false? Um, the issue you raised before of the um, Comet uh, Ping Pong pizza case, the gentleman uh, who did the invasion gets four years in prison. The person who, who gave the information that was false gave a, rescinded it, but what happens to him? What is the issue of freedom of speech with false information? How many of you are lawyers? <laughs> You all have a better answer to this than I do, and in order to provide that answer, I'm now going to turn to Bob. We have deliberated about this concept since the beginning of the Republic, and we built in First Amendment protections for a really good reason. And in particular, we built in a lot of protections for political speech. And those of you who are old enough to remember radio and political advertising on radio will remember a time before, a time in which candidates automatically got access if they had money to be able to buy time on radio. The, the radio owners would only let their favorite candidates buy time. So we across time have worked out rules and regimens to try to deal with this. And we've worked out slander and libel and defamation categories. We've worked out protections that are different under some circumstances than others. We haven't before dealt with an environment in which the pseudonymous source, the anonymous source for practical purposes, because the labels are all fictitious labels, has the capacity it now has through viral connectivity to wreak havoc. I am all but a First Amendment absolutist. I think the solution to speech is speech. The solution to pernicious speech is arming an informed, caring public in order to immunize us against the pernicious characteristics, because I do not trust someone else to tell me where the boundaries are. I think history has lessons about trying to put those boundaries in, and those are lessons that say that part of the way we've preserved our country to the extent that we have over time, and sometimes we've really gone wrong. Remember George Creel in World War I? I mean, there are times in which we have acted as if we didn't believe in the First Amendment. But to the extent that we've survived as well as we have, I think it is in part because we have such strong First Amendment protections. Those protections include protections for the press. But they only work well if the citizenry is there and not terribly vulnerable and terribly gullible. And now the question becomes problematic because we always have individuals in audiences who may not be processing the world the way everyone else does. There are troubled individuals. They have access to weapons that are potentially lethal. I would not, given my strong position on the First Amendment, do anything other than do what we are currently doing in order to try to identify as best we can every form out there that's problematic and try to find democratically acceptable ways to shut it down, not ways that silence the speech. How, uh, 
um, how um, have we as a society developed in such a way that facts are no longer valued? And what are the implications of this for us as a society and the community? How many people have had a medical diagnosis and they went to a WebMD, a CDC, an NIH to seek something? Went to the Mayo site? There are times in which we become fact seekers. We become expert seekers. I'm a two-time cancer survivor. What did I do with the first cancer diagnosis? First, I found the best doctor at the best hospital by the best available evidence that I could, that I could afford with my insurance. Other problem, I have good insurance, no problem, problem for others. I also went to every website that I trusted to get additional information. So does everybody else under those circumstances. If we've empowered people to be information seekers, it's not that we have a challenge to facticity overall. It's not that we have a challenge to expertise overall. There are areas in which it really is still thriving. Even the attacks on science right now have not destabilized science. Trust in science, and this will surprise some of you because the public discourse is saying something else, but the data do not say it. Public trust in science is still higher than most other institutions, and it has not changed markedly in the last six years when there have been serious attacks to some areas of, legit, of, liter of science legitimacy. So if we still have a capacity to trust facticity and trust expertise in some domains, there's still hope for the domains in which it's being seriously challenged, and that would be the political domain right now. And that's why I am optimistic that if we can increase the capacity of the audience to do these kinds of things, if we can increase the quality of civics education in the schools so that people understand why we have branches of government and why we have an independent judiciary and why we have a First Amendment and why we have such strong protections for our press, I think we will weather this period, but it's not going to be easy. And there are people who say this is worse than it's ever been, and I disagree with them. Because, and I know there are people in the room who disagree with me about this, but I remember 68 to 72. We got through 68 to 72. Do you remember sitting down with people who disagreed with you about the war in Vietnam, regardless of which side you were on? Those were conversations that could not ever get to a factual underpinning. There were attacks on the press then too. The press turned out to be right in what it was reporting, and that served the press well. But you also had shenanigans by those who were coming into power, the Nixon overtures to Vietnam to slow the peace process. You had riots in cities. You had assassinations. We got through that. And there was, as part of that, a challenge to expertise because some of the experts were not telling us the truth. And that, in a democracy, is problematic because it calls expertise into question, but we weathered that too, and to some extent rebuilt some of that confidence in some of those experts. So I'm cautiously optimistic that if we got through that, we can get through this. Now the counter position is, we took a hit with that. We took a hit with Watergate. We took a hit with the Iraq War, Iraq won. How many hits can we sustain before we are sufficiently vulnerable that we begin to shake the underpinnings of the structure? I'm a chronic optimist. I don't think we're there yet. I'm an elderly woman. I don't think we'll be there in my lifetime. A, a related question is, you are asking people to think. How do we do that in a society <laughs> leaning towards the 15-second soundbite rather than real dialogue and research? Yeah, that, the, one of the most troubling things about this media climate is the abbreviation down to the conclusion as opposed to an understanding of how we get to it and hence why you might get to something that's different or you might get to the same conclusion through different, a different structure of argument. And we've watched the erosion of political content, the length of political content just steadily decline until we are in a Twitterverse. And it's not that you can't say important things in very limited numbers of words. Some of the most important words spoken to me in my lifetime could be fit in a tweet, and I bet the same is true with you. How many of you in the short statements in your life that you're going to value would put, will you marry me? Will you marry me? Now, the answer then is yes or no. If it's maybe, then you need the argument, right? So there are some things that we can communicate telegraphically, but there are many things that we cannot, and we cannot ground arguments 
in deep understandings if we don't have more extended exposure to discourse. So one question is, how have our schools failed us? How have we turned out so many college graduates? I am a college professor. How have I turned out so many college graduates? But we, and we, we read extended arguments. We write extended papers. We, they, write extended papers. We try to make sure that they understand patterns of inference. We try to make sure that they know how to use evidence responsibly. Why are they so susceptible to this alternative culture and so non-susceptible to the more extended? I coordinated a debate commission before the last election because we were trying to find a way to make the debates richer. Debates are still the single most useful thing we have in presidential politics, even when they're not behaving well. Because they give audiences exposure to both sides, not one side, in a comparative environment. And we see reliably that people learn from presidential debates, even those this last year, which were not the high point of the modern presidency. <laughs> so we have formats in which people will watch extended discourse. They tend to tail off toward the end of debates, but they will watch extended discourse and they can learn from it. We haven't lost the capacity. We've got to figure out how to increase the number of times we come together as a collectivity Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals, and vegetarian anarchists to experience the same discourse so that we can ground a collective sense of what the challenges are and the alternative solutions are so that when we elect someone and they start to act on it, we understand the rationale even if we didn't vote for the person. It is, I think, the single biggest challenge our educational system has. Nobody else controls the amount of time needed to solve this. And it's one of the reasons that letting civics education decline in schools is so problematic because some forms of knowing are more valuable than others if you want people to understand political discourse. Understanding why we have three branches. If you don't understand why we have three branches right now, and if you're one of those one out of three people in the adult population, and no one in that category would be in this audience, who cannot name three branches of government, if you are one of those who does not understand why we have a veto, what it takes to veto, and what it means to override, and if you are those who don't understand why we have protections around the judiciary, you're more likely to say, when you are asked, we posit that there's a series of unpopular Supreme Court decisions, should we just get rid of the court? You're more likely to say, yes, that might be an acceptable alternative. So some knowledge matters more than other knowledge. And coming out of civics education, understanding why we have a system of government and why we have peaceful transfer of power why you are not supposed to think it's acceptable for someone to say you are not my president. Even if you voted against that person and you really are worried, you're still not supposed to say that's not my president because we have a system in which that person is the president under our rules. And the system requires at a certain level that we come together and let people govern. And to the extent that they can't anymore and they just seem to be sitting there doing nothing, something has gone really wrong with civics, with education, with the body politic that elected, and with the people who are running for office. Other than that, I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs>
or when you are citing the Heritage Foundation, you are citing a source that has a track record, and it has these sorts of credentials. When you are citing someone who works for this group as opposed to that group, there's knowledge about the group that matters. To the extent that a journalist can give you those links in a real story so that you can check, we'll increase the likelihood that journalists help us understand the sources they trust and they use. And when they use suspect sources, we increase the likelihood that they will have to say to themselves, wait a minute, people are going to check to see what the source is. And as a result, maybe I shouldn't use the source. So I'd like to see more disclosure from journalists using the linking capacity of the internet. Print newspapers are going to be obsolete within my lifetime, and I'm an elderly woman. But newspapers are not. They're going to be online. And we need to be develop the capacity of on the online capacity to increase the likelihood. And here's my third point, that when you enter a story midstream, you can get the rest of the story. You can get the backstory. The problem with journalism is we go on vacation and we don't read or watch for a few weeks. And something really important can happen. And now we enter the stream, the journalist knows what's happening, but we need to be brought up to speed. The bottom of every journalistic source, our article should have all the links to the relevant sources on that topic. Most of the good newspapers now have this. The online newspapers now have this. Here's why this is so important. We spent almost a year studying the Zika virus communication of the CDC and NIH. We did a 35-week rolling cross-sectional survey to help them find out what the public knew. The journalists in the first article made sure that people knew sexually transmitted, and then they stopped saying it because they'd already said it once. In the first article, they explained why it's called Zika. Forest in Uganda, monkey got it. They didn't think they needed to explain this again. Well, they didn't if their websites linked. There's no reason every website shouldn't have linked to the CDC guidelines, including the visual guidelines, including those in multiple languages. But the sites did not come up to speed fast enough, and as a result, the survey showed the public got mosquito-borne. It did not get sexually transmitted. Well, this is the first instance of a disease we have which is both mosquito-borne and sexually transmitted. Journalists needed to develop our vocabulary and give us the links to all the backstories and give us the links to the CDC, at which point we might have prevented one transmission or a handful of transmissions and the tragedy of microcephaly for families and babies. So using the capacity of the web to create links to the vocabulary, to the expert community, and to the sources, as well as the backstories is, I think, a critical function of journalism. And if we do that well, we won't have the question about your sources, except for who are those anonymous sources and why are you quoting them all the time and are you making it up? Different problem. <laughs> and for that, I'm going to let the person who asked the question, who is a journalist, provide you the answer. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> On the very last question. Um, does either the right or the left-leaning media do a better job of policing so-called VD? The, one of the things that we saw happen in this last election was a press that had never before confronted a candidate like Donald Trump. And the press had no idea what to do. So what you saw was journalistic norms and routines and a candidacy that was actually functioning in an entirely different domain. It's a little like the end of Interstellar. If you've seen the end of Interstellar, they have five-dimensional space. And a character comes back through five-dimensional space and somehow winds up through a bookshelf talking to somebody. And you have to say, OK, now I get where journalism is. You just drop journalism into fifth-dimensional space, and they're trying to figure out who's on the other side of the, the bookshelf. It was a perfect metaphor for me. <laughs> As a result, neither the right nor the left did very well at much for a while. It really had trouble. And the, you, you saw journalists trying to figure out how to deal with it. Because, and they, were, they, they got better in some cases across time. And in some cases, otherwise really good journalists and otherwise really reputable outlets started to sound. And I think it was inadvertent as if they were partisan. And the minute you sound as if you are partisan, if you sound as if you've actually got a horse in the race and you're running against a candidate, you're reporting against a candidate instead of reporting what's there. You're risking, and here's my theory of how the world works, that part of the electorate that's open to you saying, no, you're just another partisan, and moving over into their own ideological default system. And so we, we who study journalism and we who run journalistic sites are worrying a lot about what was happening in the last election and asking the question, how could it have been done better? 
There's certainly some fine journalism across the whole campaign, done in relationship to both the Clinton and the Trump campaign. But there were certainly a whole lot of instances in which journalism just wasn't yet up to the task. And in, my sympathy for the journalists is this was an unprecedented kind of election. We've never had a candidate with a server issue, with a Comey statement, and a press conference, and a Russia allegation, and, 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 and a candidate who tweeted routinely, um, and a candidate who was inaccessible to the press largely, and a candidate who would be in the press anytime he wanted, including controlling the agenda of any news program he wanted to move on to. So the press was, I think, standing there and just, it's like the donkey between two bales of hay. I mean, there are times in which I just thought, if they weren't in an interstellar world trying to figure out who's on this side of the five-dimensional bookshelf, they were just standing there saying, oh my God. <laughs> it will improve with your help. Thank you for the opportunity to meet with you. Thank you very much, a standing ovation for Kathleen Hall Jameson.